in a series called Opportunity Knocks that I've really felt the Lord wanting me to talk to you about seeing the opportunities that are all around you in life and the reality that sometimes they don't look the way you think they're going to look. But if you miss the opportunities in life, then you miss the opportunity for God to do something in you and through you in the generation that you're living or in or in the season that you're in. And so the reality is this, that opportunities surround you constantly, but do you see them? And so we've been going through the scriptures talking about the reality of what opportunities really do look like in life. And I'd like to say this, if you ever get an opportunity, if you ever get a platform in life, if you ever get a chance at something, give it 110% because it could change your life forever, right? And so we want to see those opportunities and step up to them, lay a hold of them and take them by force. And so we've been talking about the reality is this, that opportunities are all around you, but they show up in testing and in trials, and so we miss them because we don't want them packaged in that. We, we want them to be packaged in something else. Usually we want them to be something good for us at someone else's expense, right? Or it's like, oh, that's awesome. I got an opportunity. But they're actually packaged in trials and in tests. And that's where the opportunity rests. And so the goal is, how do we go through these? How do we get out of them what's inside of them? And so we've been talking all about that. You'll have to go back to YouTube because I'm really tempted to re-preach it all and I can't do that. And so hey, let me ask you this this morning. How, how do you consider tests and trials? When they show up, how do you consider it? Is it like, I got this or, oh man, again? Why me? Why me? You ever feel like that? I just got through something. Why? Right? How, how you consider it. Here's what the Bible says. How you consider it determines what you get out of it. And so James went as far as to say, consider it joy. Consider it joy because there's something in there if you consider it correctly. And so let's, let's position ourselves to consider it correctly and get something out of it. I want to talk to you today. I'm going to kind of get in your face this morning a little bit and kind of get up in your business and just kind of hit you with some things because I feel like there's just something that our culture's kind of created that kind of puts us in a bad spot. And I, I just kind of want to get in the face of that a little bit this morning, maybe step on your toes a little bit, put some weight on your shoulders, but I believe you can bear it. And so if I sound harsh, it's because I love you. If I sound harsh, it's because I want the best for you. But the scripture says something really weighty this morning that we're going to kind of pull out and see and it's it's really how we take a disposition in life when things don't go the way we want them to go and sometimes someone has to get in your face about that right to help you out because we get so caught up in our comfortable routines that we actually don't realize when we're comfortable we don't grow and so somehow we got to get knocked out of the rut so we can grow so we can flourish and the bible does that for us and so here's what I want to talk about today. It's one thing that I've discovered in life in my desire to trust God more, in my desire to be one who trusts God, where just personally, I want, I want strong trust in the Lord. I want to be able to stand solid and say, I trust God. And in my desire to do that, I've found that those areas only come out in hard moments. You only build trust in trial. You only build trust in hard moments moments but we don't want the hard moment we all want to be able to say yeah I trust God but we don't want the moment that shows us if we do or not right I've kind of found that in my own life that the places where I found if I trust him or not are when it's not what I want it to look like it's not how I want it to go and so I said it like this trust is found in trials anyone here want to trust God anybody some of you are scared to raise your hand that might mean a trial is coming right well, one's coming whether you want it or not. Like you either just came out of one or you're just going into one. That's life. That's life. That's, we found it's, it's a great thing. But what's found in these trials is trust. When we're people that want to trust God and say, yes, I trust him, it's going to be found in trial. If I do or not is going to be found when it's not going the way I wanted it to go. And that's going to be the determining factor. Do you trust him? Is that fun or what? Does that sound fun to anybody? Nervous laughter. <laughs> I don't know, right? Trust is found in these trials and in these testings. And so how you act determines if you trust God or not. Oh man, attitude. Don't you love attitude? How we act in the moment of trial is the determining factor. Do I trust him or do I not? See, your greatest trials are your greatest opportunities to partner with God and say, what do you want to do? 
I'm trying to transform you a little bit this morning, just do some shaking. Your greatest trials are your greatest opportunities to partner up with God and say, what's up? What are we doing? What's going on? If you can see it like that, you're gonna get something out of it. One of the greatest deceptions in our culture today in how to become great in life is that it's found in my strength. But let me submit to you that everything God is trying to do with you as an individual on the earth is not make you strong in yourself, but to make you strong in him. Everything he's doing with you is to make you strong in him, not in you. And so to be great in life isn't to be strong in me. It's to be strong in him, which leaves us in a very vulnerable spot in, you know, personally, just in the way it feels and in the way our stance feels. Let me show you this. It's found in scripture today. Second Corinthians chapter 12. If you have a Bible with you, check this out. God never wanted you to build confidence in yourself outside of him. And so this is, this is like an anti-cultural idea that's been in our Bibles for years. This is Paul talking. And he said, Paul was talking to the Lord about this thing that just bothered him. He was like, God, take it away. And he said to me, the Lord answered Paul and said, my grace is sufficient for you. Check this out. For my power is made perfect in weakness. No, we don't want that. We don't want that. Look what Paul says. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. You don't hear that in America today. Paul's going, I've realized something that when I'm at my weakest, when I'm at the end, when I have nothing left, when I feel so vulnerable, that's where God's power can actually rest on my life. Let me just say it like this. Your weaknesses are very attractive to God. And we always think it's our strengths. Remember the man that got healed from the crippled hand? He's just, he's just sitting there hanging out. And Jesus shows up and says, show me your hand. Well, we'd show him our strong one. Oh, you want this, Lord? <laughs> no, the crippled one. Oh, and he heals it. Yeah. See, he loves weakness. He loves the weakness because his power can be displayed on that thing. But we don't like that in America. No way. Keep that away from me. Check out, check out verse 10. This Paul keeps talking. He said, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships, in persecutions and even in difficulties. Check this out. This gets misquoted 90% of the time from Christians. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Whoa, what? What? Did I get my Bible on sale? Like what? He's saying, when I've realized this, I'm learning this. When I feel weak, when I feel like I'm at the end of my rope, when I feel like it's not going the way I want it, that's where I'm the strongest. Yet for some reason, we always try to get our feet planted in the strength, planted in the strong spot. We are trying to find the spot to say, when I'm strong, I'm strong. But Paul's revealing this anti-cultural truth that your strength is actually in weakness, in a place where you don't feel like you have control, where you don't feel like you're gonna be able to push all the right buttons and levers and make it work the way you want. See, the, the scripture reveals this cultural lie that we've been sold, that be strong in yourself. I'm not trying to be rude this morning, but there's just little things I hear that are like, eh, where scriptures are concerned. It's like, you know, you just gotta have Faith in yourself, brother. <laughs> no, you don't. You got to have faith in God. I know myself. I don't want faith in me. And my wife can testify. Testify. No, I want faith in God. I want faith in him that when I don't understand, when I'm weak, when it's not working, when it doesn't look the way I want it to look, that's where I'm the strongest because that's where his power works which says this, he's trying to get you there. You, you walk through life and you keep trying to get stronger and stronger and stronger in yourself because that's where we feel comfortable in the flesh, but God's trying to knock us off of that to get us in the place where we're actually strong. 
I hope somebody enjoys this today because I know we don't like to hear this. It's not, it doesn't fit with our American routine, but it's where God shows up in your life. It's where God can do the most in our lives. It's opportunity. It's all around us. And Paul just lands on it with obvious truth. When I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. And let me just say this. These weaknesses are not sin. Weakness is not uncontrollable sin. Weakness is not choosing selfishness day in and day out and day in. Weakness is not doing dumb things that end up with dumb results and going, well, I'm just weak. That's not weakness. Weakness is when it's not going the way I want it to go, when my expectations are not being met, but I still stand firm going, God, I don't understand it, but I trust you, right? Weakness is not just being an idiot and going, well, I'm weak, Lord. No, that's what his grace is for. His grace is to empower you to live a godly life. But weakness is when I don't, it, I feel like I have no control of this right now, but I'm gonna choose to trust you. That's weakness. Well, that'll make a little more sense as we go on today. Today we meet a man by the name of Job. A lot of people say Job's the problem, Jesus is the answer. Job makes prosperity preachers cringe and sovereignty preachers shout from the rooftops, right? What about Job, right? Everyone wants to know about Job. We're gonna learn a little bit about him today because the story of his life is phenomenal. And the story of Job's life is actually, you know, what about Job? What about Job? Well, actually, the New Testament tells us what about Job. When you first meet the Lord, some people think that is Job. If you want a job, go read Job. No, that's Job. He's so awesome. There's actually a book about him, the book of Job. I thought it was Job when I first got to say, I need one of those. This is not looking cool, right? It's Job, and his life is phenomenal. But look at James chapter 5. Because James chapter 5 is the New Testament version. Anytime something from the Old Testament pulls over into the New, it's usually the definition of why in the Old. And so the J James actually tells us what about Job. What was the whole thing about Job about? And it's just simple. It says this, We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. That's the whole point of Job. <laughs> 40 some chapters to realize endurance, that we're called to be a people of endurance. Anyone here for the very first week of this series, remember it was all about endurance. Let your endurance grow, right? Let it grow. Job was a man of endurance. That's what it's all about, that he persevered through it all. That's what we're to learn from Job. And so the New Testament tells us what it's about. And I love this. I want to show you two things in Job's life today that you need to live a life that matters. Two things that help you live a life that matters. Because he was a man of great endurance. That's number one. He was a man of great endurance, which means he could endure under pressure. Man, I hope we're building a generation that can endure under pressure. That can stand their ground and not just run, but just bear it out. That, it's that endurance, the ability to keep going when I'm not seeing the result. It's endurance. Yeah. And then he was also a man of humility. He was humble. He was a humble man. Endurance and humility are the two things that we pull out of Job's life today. I want to show this to you. Anyone ever had a bad day? Anyone here ever just have a bad day? Yeah? Those aren't fun. It's just like bad hair day, right? God, I'm not going anywhere, right? Just a bad day. I want to show you Job's bad day. This is all in one day. We're going to do a lot of reading today, so buckle your seatbelts. Job chapter 1. Check this out. We're going to read about his bad day, and I'm just going to keep on reading. Are you ready? One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with the, this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys, feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Verse 16, while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived. With this news, three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. 
And while he was still speaking, man, I don't want these guys on my team. Another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. And suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Anyone ever had a bad day? <laughs> uh, I thought my coffee was made wrong at Starbucks this morning. <laughs> That is a bad day. That's a bad day. All of them are dead. Look at Job's response, verse 20. Job stood up, tore his robe in grief. You know what that, you know what that is a sign of? I don't know what to do. I'm done. I'm undone. I can't take anymore. That's what that sign is. I'm undone. He tears his robe off in grief. And then he shaved his head. I don't know what that means. Shaved his head. Look at this, and he fell to the ground to worship. Would that be your response? Would that be my response? Or would we go into plan mode, pushing levers and pulling buttons and getting back to comfortable? I gotta get this back where I was. He falls on the ground to worship. And look what he says, check this out. And he said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise be to the name of the Lord. What? This is weakness. This is the realization that I'm not about all of the stuff. I'm not about all of the things. There's something way bigger to life than the tangible. Let me ask you this, are you more consumed with the created or the creator? That's what Job realizes. That's the response that he's saying. My eyes are gonna be fixed on the creator right now, not the created. It's a realization that I'm not gonna freak out and build my whole life around what I've lost in the created. I've gotta focus on the creator, the one who is in charge of all of this. It's a phenomenal response. How would we have responded? It shows us what our trust is put in. What is our trust really wrapped up in? What is our strength really wrapped up in? I love this response. Praise the name of the Lord because I have, I have no understanding of what to do right now. But I know you do. It's an opportunity for God to show up this is an opportunity. <laughs> it does not sound like one. This is an opportunity yes. for God yeah. to show up. You might be sitting in an opportunity this morning, right now, that maybe doesn't look like one, but it is. It's all how we consider it in the stance that we take. Let me just say it like this. Make sure that you don't think so highly of yourself that God needs to follow your plans. I'm preaching to myself this morning as well, but I feel like God's wanting to do something cultural in us. He's wanting to build something in us as his people on how to really be people that live for God. Don't think so highly of yourself that God needs to follow your plans. Have you ever told someone or told God that God needs to do something else? You ever in conversation kind of describe what God should be doing? Maybe not even realizing it. You know what I think God needs to do with this situation. <laughs> Maybe sometimes you haven't said it, but you thought, if I was God? <laughs> or here's a, even a better one. Oh, I know what I'm going to ask him about when I get there. Oh, really? Isn't that funny how we do that? Like, oh, Lord, I got some questions for you. I think it's funny, we could have walked with Jesus and we still would have had problems with him. And he was perfect. His hair's too curly. I don't like his sandals, right? We're just, we're just crazy that way, we are. We, where I think God should be doing something else because he's not doing it right. He's not doing it my way. Don't think so highly of yourself that God needs to follow your plans. Because you're gonna miss every opportunity that's out there. You know why? Because when trials hit, your plan's messed up, God's doing something wrong. God's trying to show us something big here this morning. 
Check this out. Humility is the ability to endure without telling God that he's right or wrong. Humility is the ability to endure any situation without telling God if he's right or wrong. Let me show you the scripture. This is from Job. The very next scripture. This to me is one of the most important scriptures in this whole thing. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. This is the weight that I felt God talking to me about this week. Some of you are blaming him. Some of you have blamed him. Some of you have pointed a finger to the sky and told him what he needs to be doing differently. How could you? How could you let that happen? And I told you I'm going to be weighty this morning. I'm not trying to be rude, but it's a realization that we get in these places where it's my path, it's my way, it should have gone, it should look like, it should never have happened. And yeah, maybe it should never have happened, but we never want to get in this spot. Let me just say, we've never had a day like Job had. And he didn't sin because he didn't blame God. The danger with trials is when we get in a position where we start blaming him about what it should look like or what it shouldn't have looked like. And I want to spare us today from ever getting in a place where we miss the power of God upon our life because we're standing strong in what should have happened. No, I'm staying weak, Lord. I'm staying weak. My trust is in you, God. The story of Job. The one thing, it's one thing to endure. Listen to me, it's one thing to endure something. It's another thing to endure with humility in your heart. Realizing that God is always right. He's always right. And it's all about how do you see it. How do you see it? It's all about how you see it. Getting through trials, getting through testings, getting opportunity is all about how you see it. How do you see it? And that's what needs to shift sometimes is how, how we see it. Some of you are telling God he's wrong. <laughs> According to who? <laughs> right? That's what I think. Like, this shouldn't look this way. Who are you? Like, God is God. He's awesome. He's for you. He's for your good. He's amazing. It's just us getting in the right position to see it come through in our life. And so trials keep you human. And God, God, the creator of humans. I, I heard one time God totally blessed this guy. And he was like, oh, he was just couldn't believe that God gave it to him. And he goes, oh, you the man. And God went, no, I'm God. You're the man. And it was like, oh, yeah, 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 right? Don't forget that. He's God. You're the man. You're the man. Trials keep you human. Trials constantly remind you, he's God. He's God, not you. He's God, not you. But the cool part about them is they're always a setup for something greater. They're always a setup for another opportunity if we consider them correctly. There's so much in these testings and trials that we can actually get out of them if we don't just get mad and try to run from them. Remember, trials lead to trust. Trials lead to trust. We want to be people who can trust God. And the goal, the goal in all of it is to know God better. It's to get to know who he is. Let me just say what God was trying to do with Job is he wanted him to know him. God wanted Job to know who he was in a full extent. He's trying to get him to know him. The better we know God, the better we persevere. See, the better we know him, the better you will endure under pressure. The better you know God, the better you'll be under pressure. You want to know why? Because you'll lay a hold of him. You won't blame him. Because you'll know he's good. You'll know you can trust him even when it doesn't look the way you want it to look. And so we come back to Job. Satan, Satan's the one in charge of all this trying to make Job fall. Satan comes back to God, and it, the scripture talks about this, and Satan comes back to him and says this, I want to test him one more time because I think I can make him turn his back on you. That's what this, the enemy is trying to do this. I think I can make Job turn his back on you. And I love this. 
sometimes we wish God wouldn't trust us so much. <laughs> God's like, try him. You just can't take his life. Because the enemy's pretty much like, yeah, you can destroy someone's stuff and they'll still serve you. Let me go after his health and see if he'll stand. And God's like, try him. You just can't kill him. Does that sound fun or what? Let's look at the next part of this. Job 3, 7. Chapter 3, verse 7 says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. Wow, that sounds really encouraging. <laughs> ashes are like humility. They would humble themselves in dust and ashes as humility, like, God, I'm just broken. I don't know what else to do. Verse 9, here comes his wife. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. <laughs> Thanks, babe. <laughs> Married a good one. Tim Hawkins says, it's interesting that the enemy wanted to torment him, and so he left his wife and took everything else. I didn't say that, Tim Hawkins did, but I did laugh when he said it. <laughs> Why don't you just curse God and die, Job? And Job's so honorable. He, said, he replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. That's good advice, man. He didn't call her foolish. He said, you're just acting like one. That isn't you. You ain't like that, baby, right? You're talking like a foolish woman. So we, look at what he said. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And Americans would say, absolutely not. It should be all good for our whole life, right? This is so phenomenal. Really, really, babe, should we only accept the good God's given us and none of the bad? Like, is that really what we're after? Is that really who we are? Is that really what life is? It's just a phenomenal response of weakness that I'm going to trust God no matter what situation I'm in. It doesn't have to go perfect for me to honor God and give him my whole life. Look at the next verse. In all of this, once again, Job did not sin in what he said. So he didn't sin in the beginning because he never blamed God for any of it. And he didn't sin here because he didn't say anything that would have been against God or blaming him again. He didn't sin in what he said. And so notice this, what you say and what comes out of your mouth in the moment of testing matters. When we're in the middle of testing, what comes out of our mouth matters. It really matters because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so what's coming out of my mouth is actually revealing what I really, where I really stand. Where am I in my own strength or am I I'm trusting God? What comes out of my mouth matters in the midst of trials. Determine on what I'm going to get out of it. How you see it. How you see it matters. It's about how you see it. How do you see the situation you're in? How do you see God when you're in the middle of a situation. How we see it. I want to help us see it. And so first, I encourage you to go home and read Job with this understanding. It's so good. There's 37 chapters after this where Job and his friends go back and forth about his situation. And his friends come around and try to help him. And you know, your friends are always like, well, there's probably sin in your life. I mean, that's where the problem's coming from, right? They always have great advice, and they're just going on and on about what's wrong with Job and why this is happening, and they're trying to really take inventory of who God is and why this would be going on in Job's life. It's funny how we just try to get things out of our life as fast as possible. So we try to find out the reason. What's the reason? Isn't that funny? What's the reason why? I just want to get it out. Maybe God's showing you something. It's how you see it. And so they go on and on and on trying to figure out why is this happening? And Job finds himself in this place where he starts to get a little testy with God. And he kind of gets in this spot where he kind of starts to call God on according to his righteousness. Like, Lord, I haven't done anything. As far as I know, I've done nothing wrong to deserve this. Like he kind of gets that little about him. And God responds. And I love this part. It's actually three full chapters that I can't read to you, but I challenge you to go home and read them. God responds to Job's a little bit of attitude, if you will, and puts him in his place. 
And I believe, I believe it's the, it's the eye-opening reality for every trial that you will ever face is to realize who he is. Because if we're not careful, no matter how hard the trial is, we will start to even ourselves with God and telling him why it shouldn't be this way. Even if we're not saying it, we're thinking it. It shouldn't be this way. I don't deserve this. And we start to even ourselves and we can't do it. Trials should always make God bigger and me smaller. Testing should always make God bigger and me smaller because I trust in him to get through it because there's something in it bigger than what I can see. Look at the last part of this. God declares to Job his majestic side so that he can see it because it matters how you see it. Let me just say, God's not mean. He's big. He's awesome. And he's the creator of all. Amen? He is our creator. Check this out. Job 38. It goes from 38, I think, to 41, where God is responding. And I challenge you to go home and read these chapters because God talks about things you might never even have thought of before. He talks about all the stuff that he's in charge of. It will blow your mind. Go read it. I'm telling you, you will love it. But this is just a little part of it. I wanted to read all of it, but the kids group would have been so mad at me for taking the time because it's so much. Check this out. I'm just going to read. This is so cool. (laughs) Just makes God so big. The Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Notice out of the storm. You in a storm right now? Let him speak. And he said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, and I'll question you, and you answer me. (laughs) Okay, right? You don't want God saying that to you. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, you understand. You'll notice God has a little sarcasm in here, like, come on, Job, you were there that day, weren't you? When I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. (laughs) I love that. Who stretched out a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set, concrete workers? Or who laid its cornerstone? Come on, Job. Where's your answers? While the morning stars sang together, I didn't know they sang, and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no further, here is where your proud waves halt. I mean, this is just like, whoa. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. I didn't know that. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me, you know all this. <laughs> is this phenomenal to any of you? Like, oh my goodness, this is God. And for three chapters, he goes on and on and on about these phenomenal things that he does, asking Job, do you know any of this, Job? Do you partake in any of this with me? Do you partner with me in any of this stuff? It all came out of a trial. See, it's the point of trials, church. It's the point of testings to get our life in the proper place under God, under who he is. It's trust. And then last but not least, it's the very end. There's so much. Look what Job says. Job 42, verse 1, Job responds. And then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? And surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. And here's the key to all trials, church. 
what Job took out of this situation. Verse 5, my ears have heard of you, but my eyes have now seen you. This is the point. So many people have heard of God. They've heard of him. They've heard of his ways. They've heard of what he's doing. They heard of what you should be doing and what he might be doing and what maybe he'll do. Oh, I've heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. This trial, this testing has brought the revelation of who you really are. I see you now, Lord. We would say it like this. I know you better now. Look at the response. And therefore, since I've seen you for who you are, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. <laughs> this is the greatest response. You know what this takes us all the way back to? In my weakness, I am strong. Therefore, I will glory in trials and hardships because in this place in this place right here is where i am the strongest he's pretty much saying it's not all about me i'm not building my own thing it's not going to be my plan or no way god have your way and the whole opportunity inside of testing is when i can see god for who he really is and when you see him you can trust him See him for who he is. You can trust him. Yeah, it might not be going your way today. Your life might not look the way you hoped it would look at this age or at this season or at this time in life. The journey might not have looked the way you had written out and hoped. But I'll tell you what. God is good and he's for your good. And he knows where you are and he knows your situation. And he's willing and ready to bring you through with restoration. Because he's good. He always brings you to restoration if you'll stand your ground and trust him. Always. Because he's God. Look at the end of Job's life. Let me give you one encouragement before we look at this last scripture. And this is weighty. This is the weight of this entire series that I felt this week. And please carry this with you. If you don't know him, you'll blame him. didn't do it and he's not doing it and if you're in the middle of it he hasn't left you alone so many times we turn against the very one that we need to turn to because of the trial, because my plan isn't going the way I want it. I want you to know him today. I want you to know him. If anybody had an excuse or a reason to blame him, it would have been Job, because he was a righteous man. But he didn't do it. I want to show you the end of this. Job 42:12 says, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. That's like Escalades and Mercedes. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their fathers granted them an inheritance along with their brothers, which means it went on and on. The generation kept going for the inheritance. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. That's prosperity in their day, generation to generation to generation. And so Job died an old man full of years. It's restoration. The greatest trial leads to the greatest provision. The greatest hardships lead to the greatest hopes. It really is true. And God restores him completely. And I like to say, punches the enemy in the lip. You thought you'd get him, Satan. Not even a chance. 
And this massive trial ended up being this huge opportunity where Job's at a whole other level of walking with God because of something we don't want to see in our lives. They're opportunities. So how do you see it? How you see it matters. May we see God for who He is rather than just hear of Him. So my challenge for you today, three things, endurance, humility, and seeing God correctly are the three things I challenge you to take away and invest into any trial, any situation, anything that's hardship. Take these with you. Let these three things be the area of your life where you flourish. Endurance, humility, and seeing God correctly. Knowing Him for who He is. Amen.